This morning we're beginning with the Lamb of God. And I know that's something that is very personal to many of us when we sing that song. And in our song service tonight, we're going to be looking at that more specifically and singing that song about Jesus being that Lamb of God. As we gather around the table this morning and remember that Jesus went to the cross and gave His life that we might have the forgiveness of our sins, we can't help but have the images of Jesus being that sacrificial lamb laid upon the altar and His blood spilling for the forgiveness of, of mankind's sins. And so these three words, sanctified, sacrificed, and salvation, are especially important words. They're going to be words that are going to reoccur throughout the lessons over especially these next six months as we talk about who Jesus is, but especially this morning, that Jesus was sanctified. That means He was consecrated or set apart. He was chosen, just as it was that the Passover lamb was one that was supposed to be chosen from among the flock, and that it wasn't just to be any lamb but it was to be a lamb of, uh, that met certain specifications. Jesus, we're told in the New Testament, was chosen by God, even though He was despised by men. That not only was He one who was sanctified and chosen, but that He was sacrificed. It wasn't that Jesus' life was taken from Him. He laid it down for all of mankind. And He was sacrificed willingly for the sins of all of us. And so when you think about can you be saved, Jesus is willing for you to be saved. That's what salvation is all about. You can't free yourself. Someone else had to come in to offer you that freedom. And Jesus did that. He found you in the deepest, darkest of pits that He might come in and save you, release you from the burdens of sins. And so it's our prayer that as we go through these ideas over the next several months that it helps us to understand and appreciate our Savior that much more. And as I said, especially as we think about Jesus being this Lamb of God. As was read for us, and I appreciate that Derek set the context in John 1, 29 through 36, that John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, there's a lot of different things that he could have said about Jesus. He could have said, Behold, the, the King of Israel. He could have said, Behold, the, the Holy One of God. He could have said, Behold, God's Anointed One. But instead, John chose these words, Behold, the Lamb of God. And as many suppose, this was probably during the springtime of the year. And this is when the banks of the Jordan would have most of the water in it. John's understandably there baptizing. But also during this time is also the time in which the, the Passover would fall upon. And during that time, they would have been preparing to, thinking about, or maybe they had already just recently made the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. And so I think it's significant that when John says these things, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that John, it seems to be that he knew something about what it was that Jesus came to do. Take away the sins of the world. But describing him as a lamb, understandably, would point to the fact that he's going to give his life in order for this to happen, because that's what lambs did. So John's statement here is one that we look at and it's very inspiring, it's very encouraging when we hear it, but we need to understand what is meant by this idea of, of a lamb. Throughout the Scriptures, there's always been this, this idea and principle that's been put forth about the animals being sacrificed for the sins of mankind. One of the first examples you see of that, at least in a shadow, is in Genesis chapter 4 where Abel takes of, the, of his flock and he offers one of those as a sacrifice. It's not specifically said that it's a lamb. We suppose that it probably was, but it doesn't say specifically that it was. It doesn't say specifically that it was because of sins that had been committed, but we know that sin had entered into the world, and then we read about these sacrifices. The first time, however, that we actually read about a lamb being sacrificed purposely and being told to is in Genesis chapter 22. And you remember in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham is told that he's to take Isaac, his son of promise, and go to this mountain, Mount Moriah. You remember that Mount Moriah is the place that later on that Jesus is going to be sacrificed upon. And that when Abraham is given this commandment, he takes his son, he takes the wood for the sacrifice, he lays it upon the animals, they go on a three-day journey to this Mount Moriah. And when he gets there, he tells his servants that they are to stay there while he and the lad go and worship yonder. And then he makes this remarkable statement that the Hebrew writer points back to to say that Abraham knew that somehow God was going to bring him back from the dead. Because Abraham says, and we will return to you. But when he goes up to the mountain, Isaac asks his father, he says, I see all the provisions that are here for the sacrifice, but where's the lamb? And then God makes that, or Abraham makes that statement about God, where we get the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide for himself a lamb, a sacrifice. 
And then also later in that chapter it says that they offered that ram, that lamb, instead of his son. And so upon this first time that we see a lamb being offered as a sacrifice, it's in connection with being offered instead of someone else. This thing that was going to fall upon Isaac now fell upon the lamb instead. It's also interesting that this is the first time that we read about it in the Old Testament. The first time that we read about the lamb in the New Testament is what we read in John chapter 1. I don't know if that's a coincidence or if it's just something that's a, a, a neat fact, but to me it really stands out that the very first time that you read about lambs being sacrificed specifically is so that it may offer salvation to someone else. You also have a ram or a lamb rather that's, that's mentioned in, in the temple sacrifices. And when you think about how the, the temple sacrifices went, I mean, it was, it was rivers of blood. That it wasn't that there was just one lamb that was offered. But there was many times one lamb per person. And there were lambs that were offered maybe seven on specific festivals and, and days. In connection with the different bulls and oxen that were also sacrificed, it was a bloody time when you think about the temple sacrifices. But in Leviticus chapter 4, when you go through that chapter, it talks about all the different types of sins that a person might commit, intentional and unintentional. And toward the latter part of the chapter, it, it says that if a person commits these sins and he's offering a, a sin sacrifice, that he is to go up there and he is to place his hand upon the head of that animal. And then he's to slit that animal's throat. And then that blood that pours forth, some of that is to be put upon the altar. Because that lamb is being, suffer, is being treated that way because of what I did. Whether intentional sin or not, that dies because of me. That would be a horrific moment if you truly understood and had any compassion whatsoever, even for something as simple as an animal. It'd be a callous person who would be able to, to, to say that I'd committed sin and go up there and place their, their hand upon the animal and slit its throat and walk away and, and have no effect upon them. And yet in the New Testament, when you read about the way in which sometimes people treat the blood of Christ with great contempt, such as in Hebrews chapter 10, when we talk about sinning willfully, it is that same type of contempt that a person would show even toward an animal if that was their disposition. It reminds me... in. in of, of David when he committed his sin with Bathsheba and that he did not seem to consider how horrible what he had done really was and it was only when Nathan came and told him about this lamb that belonged to someone else that was like one of the family that this person despised his neighbor so much and treated with contempt this lamb that he just gobbled it up and sacrificed and ate it for his his friend for a meal and had no regard for it whatsoever and David was outraged thinking about the way in which a person would treat even an animal like that. And, and he has to remind David, you've done this to another person. Brethren, when we consider what it is that Jesus did for us as being this sacrificial, this Passover lamb, we can't be like David was when he didn't consider what had happened, that we'd have so much care and compassion about the lamb. How many of us would be willing to slit the lamb's throat with our hand placed upon it, knowing that we had sinned? And yet do we consider that when it comes to the death of our Savior? Do we treat it with contempt? In Leviticus 17, verse 11, God reminds them that the reason that he was doing all these things was because the life of the flesh is in the blood. But he also reminds them in that passage that I have done these things with these animals, set these regulations in place with these animals for the redemption, for the atonement, for your sins that the people might remember these things. We also read about the lamb in Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is a passage that we read very often, especially when we're observing the Lord's Supper, because it speaks of this one that in verse 2 of Isaiah 53, that he had no form or comeliness, and when we saw him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. This lamb that he begins to next talk about in the next several verses, ten times in Isaiah 53, it, it either mentions directly or there's the allusion to him bearing something, carrying a load that was rightfully ours. And this lamb was one that there was nothing about it where we said, well, that's a desirable lamb. 
That's one that we would choose. Instead, the people did despise it. And so what we understand about this lamb that's being mentioned here in Isaiah 53 is that the thing that made it so precious, so desirable, was nothing about its, uh, its appearance, was nothing about its wealth, was nothing about its station in life, but it was about what it did and what it accomplished by the doing of these things. We also understand about this lamb that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, which to me has always been a very strange and odd statement. It's one that sticks out so very much because it's not the idea that God was joyfully and gleefully offering Jesus and that it was an entertaining sight. That's not the idea. But the idea is that God wanted and desired to do this thing so that mankind's sins might be forgiven. There is no doubt that should remain in any of our minds that God wants all of us to be saved. Because this is not our lamb that we are sacrificing, that we have chosen. It's one that God chose, and he becomes our Passover lamb. He becomes the one that offers these things up that we might have forgiveness. Because he can do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Another passage I want us to think about is Revelation 5. And we'll look at this passage more in depth in a, in a future lesson when we talk about the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because this is the place where that uh, phrase comes from. In Revelation 5, it talks about who is going to be worthy of opening this scroll. And there's a mighty angel that's there. So there's all this power and majesty that's already there. Then there's this lion, the lion from the tribe of Judah, Jesus. But opening this scroll being worthy to open the scroll, not powerful enough, worthy to open the scroll. And so Jesus coming into the scene as the lion of the tribe of Judah, John turns around basically and next he sees a lamb that was slain. Who is worthy to open the scroll? It's the lamb that was slain. Being part of the Lord's kingdom is not about power and might. It's about worthiness. And you and I can never live worthy of Jesus Christ. However, as Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 tells us, we are to live worthy of the gospel. We cannot live worthy of the one who did this thing. We are not worthy to open the scroll, but we are to be worthy of what was revealed. That's the calling that we have. And these are just some of the things that we learn from some, some of the lambs that are mentioned throughout the scriptures. And so if you ever want to sit down and do a study, that would be a really good one to go through and to study all these different instances in which a lamb is mentioned. But what I want us to do for a few minutes is to talk about the, the lamb of the Passover. <clears throat> because this is the one that I believe that more specifically John probably had in mind when he mentioned this particular thing. As I said, it's probably about the same time of the year. And it's not discounting the others because I think all those play a, play a role that, that is interchangeable and, and helps and enhances one another. But the Lamb of Passover, in Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12, you remember that nine plagues have passed over Egypt. And God has been telling Pharaoh, if you will let my people go, then nothing else is going to happen. But if you do not, this next plague, this tenth plague, is going to be against all the firstborn. And they're all going to die. But God gives provision to his people. And he tells them, you take a lamb... You set it aside for several days, and then when you offer it, it has to be one that's without blemish. It has to be treated in a certain way. You're to take some of its blood, put it on the doorpost and the lentils of your home, and you're to remain in your home. Because what's going to happen is death's going to come visit all the firstborn. And God says in verse 13 of that chapter, but when I see the blood... I will pass over you. It's interesting also that in many passages where it talks about the Passover lamb, you may notice that in many of those passages the word lamb is italicized, which means that it was added for clarity. So what the verses actually read many times is that when you kill the Passover, the lamb was part of that Passover, but it became the part for the whole. And so in the, in the New Testament where it talks about Christ is our Passover, it's not that he's just our Passover lamb. He is our Passover. 
He's the whole meaning behind it. That when God sees these things, He will pass over you as well. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, that's the New Testament passage where Paul is talking to the congregation about this young man that's in the congregation that's committed this sin by having his father's wife and having her as his own. And that this thing ought not to be there. Therefore, you are to purge yourselves of this thing that's in your midst so that you might be the way in which God would have you to be. And then in verse 7, he says that this is the reason why. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And so it's not just that he is the Passover lamb, but he is the Passover itself. And as we said, that, that lamb that was offered was one that was without spot. Jesus in Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Think about the parallels between the two. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15 it says, Made him who knew no sin. And many times, especially in Hebrews, it talks about the fact that Jesus was tempted in all points just as we are, yet without sin. Paul says it many times as well about Jesus having no sin. So just as it was with the Passover lamb, Jesus had no sin as well. That this sacrifice was, was one that would bring both judgment and mercy upon those who did not have the blood over their house. It was going to bring judgment that you failed to obey the voice of God. And because of that, there are repercussions for that. However, those who did obey the voice of their God, there was mercy. And you see that in the other sacrifices as well. There was one that was taking the punishment, bearing the burden of the sin, other than the one who had committed the sin. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, and these are some very good verses in thinking about the way in which Jesus accomplished this task. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, starting at verse 1, it says... For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. In verse 9 it says... Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is one that's offered once and for all. These Egyptians had one chance and one chance alone. This one night was going to be their night of salvation. This was the opportunity that they had to take. They had had nine plagues. They had not listened to it. The Israelites were given instruction, and it wasn't something that was done instantly. Over the course of a few days, they had to prepare these lambs and get it ready. And then they had to put the, the, uh, the blood over the doorposts and on the lentils. Because the next day, it was going to be too late. Jesus, once and for all, offered salvation. This is the one and only chance that's been given to us. This is that day of salvation that's offered to us. And when you think about the memorial feast itself and observing the Passover, it had, the bones of that animal could not be broken. Back in, in Exodus chapter 12, I believe it's verse 46, that says specifically, no bone shall be breaking, broken. So think about when Jesus was offered as a sacrifice on the cross. The timing and the time of the year that it was. That the Sabbath day is coming. And because of that, he has to be taken down from the cross and he's already dead. And so no bones of his body was broken. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It's a direct parallel to this Passover feast that they remembered. That lamb was something that was supposed to be entirely consumed. I think this is something that symbolizes the way in which Jesus gave himself entirely to the will of his God. Even as he was about to be betrayed and he's praying in the garden and he's praying to God, if there be any other way than this, let it be. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That even in such moments as that, Jesus gave himself entirely. This lamb of the feast was also one that had an unleavened bread. And we know that leaven is one of those influences that we've talked about many times before that can have a devastating effect. And so back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, once again, it points to Christ that Passover, 
and how that represents that purity that we're supposed to have. In that Passover feast of Exodus 12, it was one that they had to have these bitter herbs. And throughout the Old Testament with the prophets, I fed you with bitter herbs that you might learn. It's about repentance. That when you eat it, it's bitter. So that when you remember what you've done and why it is that these things have to be done, that you would remember, I need to repent. I need to confess to my God because what's in my mouth does not taste good. And the only way to get that taste out of my mouth is confession. And that's what repentance demands as well. Also, they were to eat these meals wearing a certain attire, their belts, their staff. Many of them, it said, would, would eat these meals standing up, representing how ready they were to leave Egyptian bondage. And so there's so many parallels between what happened with their feast and their commemoration and the things that we see in our Christ and our God, that Lamb of God. They were also to remain inside, which I believe represent the kind of faith and trust they were to have in God. Imagine the screams and the wails and the crying on that night when all the firstborn are found dead, but you remain inside. Brethren, when we remain in the Lord, there's a lot of things that we hear outside that may scare us, may frighten us, can actually cause us to want to flee from where we're at. But brethren, being in the Lord is that place of safety. It's that place of security. The Passover was one of those things that reminded them of that. Christ is our Passover. When we partake of things such as the Lord's Supper, it is to remind us not just of His death and His burial and His resurrection, but also who we are as the body of Christ. So with all those things being said when we talk about the Lamb of God, let's go to our theme idea. Because He is this Lamb of God, who are we supposed to be? What are some lessons that we can learn from that? I think one is this, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Paul's in the midst of a discourse talking about how people who live unrighteously early in this chapter will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says such people were some of you. He talks about some of the things that were could be expedient, but he's not going to do those things just because they're expedient and they may be lawful. But he's going to choose those things that are better. And in the midst of that conversation, he starts talking about sexual immorality and things such as that. But then he reminds them, you were Therefore, glorify God in your body because you don't belong to yourself. You think Isaac was thankful that God provided the lamb? You think the Israelites were thankful that God provided the lamb? That the people who were sinning in Exodus were grateful, even in spite of what they had to do, that God provided the lamb? We need to realize that lamb was sacrificed for us. You don't belong to yourself. You were purchased by another. You were bought back. And because of that, you owe it to God to glorify him. You'll never be worthy of the son. You'll never be worthy of the lamb. But you can be worthy of the gospel. And that's what we're called upon to be and to strive for. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 reminds, Paul's reminding the brethren that they're not to continue in sin so that grace may abound as great as grace is. God forbid, he says. Do you not know that those who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So just as this lamb was sacrificed, in another way, brethren, we are sacrificed as well. We died with that lamb. But the glorious thing about that lamb is that, as we saw in Revelation 5, he's as a lamb that was slain, and yet he lives. And we're going to talk about later this month that Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Because it's not enough just to die to sin, but we're to be raised to walk in newness of life. That's why we offer ourselves, as, Re as Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us, that we're continually offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Because this is a reasonable request. It is our holy and righteous duty to do this thing because that is what Christianity is about. Always giving our life daily for the lamb that was slain for us. And then lastly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 32, that passage that talks about the Lord's Supper. If you'll turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and starting at verse 23. 
Paul reminds them, and it cannot help but echo back to the lamb that was slain. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's a lot more than just the academic of eating the bread. You do this in remembrance of me. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the sacrifice. Behold the unleavened bread and the purity that it represented. In verse, verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Again, think about, behold, the Lamb of God. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and the sacrifice that he made. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Just as it was with John the Baptist when he said, behold, the Lamb of God, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, we say to God, we say to others, behold, the Lamb of God. Verse 27, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The Israelites were not just to think about the fact that on the night in which the tenth plague passed through Egypt, that the Egyptians firstborn died and the Hebrews did not. There was a lot more involved in that. And so it is with us as well. Do not despise this cup. Because he who eats this dr or drinks in an unworthy manner, verse 29, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning, not properly dividing and understanding the Lord's body. And it's because of that many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. It's not because they did not understand that the bread represented the body or the cup represented the blood, but they didn't rep remember what e any of those things actually meant in their day-to-day -day lives and in their communion with the Lord and thereby their communion with each other either. It means a lot more than that. And because of that, many can suffer. For if we would judge ourselves, in other words, if we would judge ourselves correctly, we would not need to be judged by someone else. In verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened. This is the one who's judging us by the Lord. That we, be, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another. The term that is there means to take one another to heart. It's not the idea of only time. Think about what you're doing. And think about who you are when we partake of the Lord's Supper. So because Jesus is the Lamb of God, I have access to this meal. And this meal is one that inspires, it directs, it proclaims. Brethren, it holds us close to our God. And may God allow us to let it ever be so among ourselves especially. So my question for you this morning is, is the Lord your Passover lamb? If you're not yet a Christian, you cannot yet say that he is. And that blood has not yet been applied so that when the Lord sees the blood, he will pass over you. That wrath and that judgment still remains. But this is the time. This is the opportunity for forgiveness because he was slain for you that you might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. If there's some way that we can help you this morning, if you need to be baptized or to come back to the Lord and, and live for Him more faithfully, whatever that need may be, won't you please let it be known as together we stand and sing.